In September 2019, the FTC reached a settlement with YouTube regarding their violation of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. The ultra-short summary is that under COPPA, you're not allowed to collect identifying data from children 12 and under without verifiable parental consent. What the complaint alleged was that while YouTube was claiming to be COPPA compliant by restricting their platform to individuals 13 and older, they did, in fact, knowingly gather vast troves of data from children 12 and under, market YouTube to content creators as the dominant platform in children's entertainment, and use the collected data to shape a behaviorally targeted ad network that they actively sold to child-directed content creators, with corporate channels operated by Hasbro and Mattel being specifically named in the complaint. As part of the settlement with the FTC, YouTube has agreed to pay $170 million for these violations and to institute a system whereby channel operators voluntarily identify child-directed content, at which point information gathering features will be disabled on those videos or channels. YouTube has subsequently implemented two new systems. The first is, as directed, a system that requires channel owners to indicate if their content is child-directed, colloquially, for kids. This flag can be set at the channel owner's discretion on a video-by-video -video basis or as a channel-wide setting. This is the system the settlement mandated. The second is an algorithm-driven, automated system that seeks out potentially child-directed content and automatically flags it for kids. The exact operation of this system has not been disclosed to channel owners, however it is safe to assume it includes analyzing language used in the title and description, and a measure of image analysis of the video itself, possibly language analysis of the soundtrack. YouTube is not required to do this. They have implemented this voluntarily, an element that they have loudly proclaimed in an effort at positioning themselves as eager and willing to go above and beyond in complying with the settlement. Additionally, the FTC has stated that they consider channel owners on YouTube to be what COPPA defines as operators, which is to say that an individual YouTube channel should be viewed in the same classification as a website, such as MyLittlePony.com, with YouTube merely functioning as the host. Under this classification, channel owners are strictly liable for COPPA compliance on any child-directed content and may be subject to fines exceeding 40000 US per infringing video. In practical terms, an infringing video is one that is child-directed but has not been properly flagged as such. Again, it's worth remembering that the FTC's primary examples informing this opinion were YouTube channels operated by existing corporate entities manufacturing child-directed content and products such as Hasbro, Mattel, Nickelodeon, and Disney. On the whole, I absolutely agree that there was, in fact, wrongdoing on the part of YouTube and on the part of several child-directed channels. The FTC's complaint and the resulting settlement are absolutely well-founded. There are undeniable problems in how YouTube handles children's entertainment that need to be addressed, and in that solution, channel owners, without question, bear some responsibility in ensuring that child-directed content is produced and delivered with due respect for the privacy of their audience. I would like to focus, however, on where the implementation of this agreement has gone wrong, resulting in a substantial disruption in operation for a wide range of channels that bear only superficial similarities to actual, child-directed content. The automated systems that YouTube has implemented aligns with what Commissioner Rebecca Slaughter called a technological backstop, an automated system to identify undesignated child-directed content and turn off behavioral advertising. In her dissenting statement on the settlement, Commissioner Slaughter proposed such a system as a mechanism to ensure that content creators are telling the truth when they designate their content as not child-directed. In Chairman Simons and Commissioner Wilson's joint statement on the settlement, they acknowledge Commissioner Slaughter's preference for a technological backstop, but Simons and Wilson dismiss the option as it would be, in their opinion, an empty gesture. YouTube could easily develop a half-hearted measure that would technically comply with the order and give the public a false sense of security. Moreover, such a measure likely would catch in its net channels not directed at children, therefore limiting content to other audiences while the errors are resolved. This is, in effect, exactly what YouTube has done. The system that they have chosen to implement meets the requirement of the settlement for a system of self-designation, but additionally goes further, bluntly implementing an algorithmically driven system that automatically designates content as for kids based on oblique, overly broad criteria. 
This has had the exact effect Simons and Wilson foresaw, generating a huge volume of false positives, most notably in adult-facing channels that discuss all ages and children's media from the perspective of adults in the role of collectors, educators, editorialists, and documentarians. How this plays out for channel owners on a day-to-day -day basis is that it adds another automated detection system that imposes action on the channel immediately and without warning. A video that is misdetected as child-directed is instantly placed in the 4Kids classification, forcing channel owners to either wait through the appeals process or remove, alter, and re-upload the video. In order to have their work seen, YouTubers rely on a sophisticated network of recommendations, a system that is driven by a series of abstract metrics colloquially referred to as engagement. Engagement is tied to viewer actions such as rating a video, leaving a comment, subscribing to a channel, adding the video to a playlist, and viewing other videos from the same channel in succession. The 4Kids classification removes several of these systems from a video, notably comments, subscriptions, playlists, and ratings. Removing these directly limits the degree to which a video can be engaged with, and thus its position within YouTube's recommendations. As working professionally on YouTube is a highly time-sensitive business with critical windows for revenue generation, misidentification of content as child-directed at key times early in a video's life can have disastrous impact on the revenue of adult-facing content. Additionally, misidentification of adult-facing content as child-directed has and will continue to lead to a substantial quantity of content that is inappropriate for children being added to the 4Kids classification. While the appropriateness of children's entertainment is in the purview of the FTC and is out of the scope of COPPA, it is a related issue that is already being hotly debated on the platform, and it is worth considering that YouTube's new automated system has farther reaching impacts than just the issues immediately at hand. In rolling out this system, YouTube has been vague with users, generating a tremendous amount of chaos, uncertainty, and animosity that they have done little to dispel, but much to direct towards the FTC itself, seemingly intent on overwhelming the commission with an unparsable volume of uninformed panic that could serve to delay or soften the terms of the agreement against them. While the commission has recognized the existence of all ages content and differentiated to some degree between age appropriate and child directed, YouTube has, in their communication with creators, stressed an overly vague definition of for kids with overt stress on the possible penalties. This has led many users to conflate YouTube's broad and ill-defined definition of for kids with the FTC's, a conflation that YouTube has been silent about addressing. A folk narrative has evolved among users where they have come to believe that they are potentially liable to the FTC for anything as small as incidental inclusion of children's characters in their videos or a mere cosmetic overlap in interests. As an example, the YouTube sub-community of adult craftspeople modifying children's toys, particularly fashion dolls, using sophisticated adult techniques including caustics, solvents, razor blades, power tools, and sewing machines, has been led to believe that the simple overlap of dolls as an interest category is sufficient to not only have their channels labeled for kids by YouTube's blunt algorithm, but expose them to potential FTC action if they appeal to have their full monetization and engagement features reinstated. Rather than create an environment where child-directed content creators are worried about the consequences of trying to circumvent the for kids classification, General audience content creators are panicking about the hypothetical consequences of accurately describing their content as not for kids. Some measure of automated detection is likely necessary to stay ahead of serial offenders, like child-directed content mills cranking out nursery rhyme cartoons. However, the application of this automated system on a video-by-video -video basis, paired with confusing and vague directions for channel owners, has served only to generate chaos. I want to explicitly acknowledge that channel owners absolutely bear some responsibility in compliance. The solution the FTC mandated requiring channel owners to self-identify child-directed content 
is a reasonable burden. However, YouTube has additionally passed much of their burden of compliance onto channel owners as well, and have done so without giving channel owners the appropriately granular mechanisms or educational resources to make informed, conscious decisions about how data is collected from and utilized on their channels. This burden is being borne mostly not by corporate channels such as Mattel, Hasbro, or Disney, who do not rely on YouTube for substantial revenue, nor by inarguably child-directed independent YouTube channels, but by channels producing all-ages content that they have monetized with a good-faith assumption that YouTube was telling the truth about COPPA compliance, that their channels and the ads on them were being served to an audience aged 13 plus. While YouTube could simply remove child-directed advertising from their behavioral ad model entirely, or use their clearly demonstrated ability to discern under 13 viewers and disable behavioral advertising selectively at the user level, they have instead chosen to structure their system to place the burden and consequences overwhelmingly on channel operators. YouTube is, in effect, trying to build a scenario where they are still allowed to gather and utilize children's data in serving targeted behavioral ads with the blame falling on channel owners for allowing them to gather that information and serve those ads. Channel owners do have some granular control over the types of ads that appear on their channels, however, these controls are not contained within the YouTube platform itself, but within its sister product, AdSense. And for basic users, these AdSense controls do not include explicit age group targeting or exclusion, only implicit control based on large subject matter categories. By default, all channels accept ads in all categories except gambling and alcohol products. In practical terms, the majority of YouTube channels lack the resources to collect meaningful audience data on their own and are wholly reliant on the data that YouTube chooses to share with them. Because this data set does not include information on children 12 and under, the vast majority of good faith all ages content producers do not have actual knowledge of their child audience and would, if provided the opportunity, willingly disable behavioral ads directed at children. Indeed, many channel owners assumed this was already the case. While it is possible for channel operators to opt out of behavioral advertising as a whole and limit their ads to contextual ads only, the controls to do so are deeply hidden, and, as Commissioner Slaughter observed, channel owners are warned against doing so because it may, quote, significantly reduce your channel's revenue. It is worth noting that channel owners are given no additional data to verify that claim or assess what YouTube considers to be a significant reduction. Channel owners' perception of their incentives and resulting behaviors are overwhelmingly shaped by YouTube because YouTube controls both access to and framing of that information. It is worth considering to what degree channel owners are left in the dark about where their interests and YouTube's interests diverge. Lastly, while the FTC has determined that individual YouTube channels are operators under COPPA and thus have a strict liability for compliance, I don't feel like that is an appropriate one-size-fits-all descriptor. While it applies to many channels, notably corporate channels that have the resources to maintain a self-contained network of related content and negotiate with YouTube directly as both advertisers and content creators, the majority of channels simply must take whatever YouTube chooses to give them. Contrary to the Commission's framing, YouTube is not collecting data on my behalf as an operator, but is merely allowing me to view a select slice of that data that they collect regardless of whether or not I choose to activate or deactivate behaviorally targeted ads. Again, it would be possible for YouTube to address much of this compliance by making alterations to their underlying ad service. If YouTube is technologically capable of dynamically serving behaviorally targeted ads to children, something they are demonstrably capable of, then they are equally capable of using that information to disable that user's access to data collecting features, only serve contextual ads, remove ads altogether, or direct the user into YouTube Kids. YouTube has at its disposal substantially more sophisticated means to comply with the Commission's agreement. While voluntary content flagging is useful and a good measure, and some measure of automated detection is likely necessary, YouTube's response has been deliberately broad, utilizing their status as a monopoly in online video to force creators to bear the burdens of compliance without providing them with the tools and data to do so in a meaningful, educated manner.